it came up the wrong way. Um, but uh, this is this is really wonderful. Um, it's great to see all y'all here. Um, great to be here. Uh, thank you for coming out. Um, go Sun Devils. Uh, so, um, all right. So I'm gonna read for Susan and I were sort of working out the math. We figured out some sort of like carbon credit style situation where if I don't read, she gets extra minutes. Um, so we'll see how long this goes. I'm just going to read from one chapter uh, a little bit later in the book. I don't think there's much that you need to know. If I realize midway through that there is, I'll tell you and interrupt. I will uh, break the dream. Um, so what's his name? Uh, the guy who wrote Grendel would be very mad. Um, but uh, OK, so. Let's do this. My relationship history was littered with jelly-brained lunks. Men who quoted Joe Rogan at dinner, who blew their savings on collectible knives, men who brewed IPAs in their best friends' basements, who, propo who proposed marriage at basketball games, and would fight anyone who did not think the first lethal weapon was a classic. <laughs> I fucked them because I liked predictable men, the guarded and the repressed. Sensitive men couldn't be trusted. They assumed their sensitivity made them special, deserving of praise. Most sensitive men were, at their cores, narcissists who constructed elaborate expectations for how relationships were meant to evolve. When these expectations weren't met, the facade of sensitivity deteriorated into a petulant rage. What I knew about sensitive men, I learned from Blake Days. I met him after a fundraiser for Click, an organization that paired underprivileged children with digital cameras. Cassandra brought me along as her plus one. This was six months before my appearance on Wake Up America, six months before Lucas DeVry's death. Cassandra's meditation practice wasn't any more popular than Abandon. Abandon is, uh, uh, lifestyle brand that the narrator runs. She had 3,000 fewer followers, but she knew powerful people in powerful places who threw powerful parties to honor their power. She reveled in wielding her influence for me. It's absolutely crucial, she said, that people with privilege use it to advance the careers of people like you. She drifted away from me as soon as we entered the party. I was approached by Cy Cunningham, an acclaimed podcaster who had recently completed a month-long silent retreat in a derelict bait boathouse. I developed a profound admiration for my pulse, he told me. I got the sense he isolated himself only to later tell people about it. We stood amid a crowd of bright, beautiful people with cocktails cooling our hands. Cy wore a tuxedo the color of matcha. Product weighed down his curly black hair, a mole poked out of his lip, and it took everything in me not to touch it. Have you listened to silence? He asked. You're that Psy? I said, like I didn't already know. People like Psy prefer to, pr to reveal their identities, like superheroes peeling off masks for the public. Silence consisted of 60 minutes of silence, plus two segments from sponsors. And on rare occasions, it was rumored, Sai could be heard breathing into the mic. His most committed listeners argued for the authenticity of these moments with the enthusiastic paranoia of alien abductees. Ciphers, they called themselves. Sai placed his empty glass on a passing tray. These parties are such an illusion, he said. I couldn't tell whether he was trying to sleep with me or I was trying to sleep with him. They don't mean anything, never have. I don't know why, or I don't know what keeps bringing me back. His words dripped with the cultivated wariness of familiarity. He'd been born on the Upper East Side, the only son of a hedge fund manager and a hedge fund manager's wife. He'd been raised on party, at parties thrown by people who hated parties. His indifference was a brand on his back, proof he belonged among those who spoke the language of strategic confessions and origin stories. 
Where I grew up, wariness and indifference arrived in the form of soul-bruising lethargy in phrases like, what can you do? Indifference resulted from being treated indifferently. At events like this, talking to people like Sai, I felt as if I were crossing a rickety wooden bridge, clutching the frayed rope handles, stepping over rotted slats in the bridge, and waiting to plummet into the canyon beneath. But the topic of weariness bored me, and when our conversation lulled, I asked a question I love asking strangers. What's your least favorite city? Party questions, he scoffed, then excused himself. The bridge cracked under my feet. On a white steel stage at the front of the room, an acoustic guitarist tapped the mic. He was tall and conventionally pretty, like an old church with long maple hair pulled back in a ponytail. His posture was as stiff as a telephone pole. I'm Blake Days, he said, and I have one question for everyone here. What have you done for love today? Instead of listening to him sing, I wondered what I had done for love that day, wondered what Blake had done for love, always returning to him, the center of gravity in the room. And three songs in, he disappeared into an unmarked door in the corner. The crowd gave him a bewildered ovation. Claire Lance, the founder of Click, stepped on stage. She was as trim and sharp as her name and wore her platinum hair in a bob cut with a saber. Her appearance had the permanence of a mountain. She lived outside of time, outside of judgment. In addition to Click, she'd founded dozens of orphanages in sub-Saharan Africa so stylish and modern, the orphans dressed immaculately that no one ever criticized her for having a white savior complex. <laughs> Thank you for coming tonight, she said. Your generous donations this evening will help put cameras into the hands of over 500 malnourished children. <laughs> As everyone clapped, I surveyed the, cloud, the crowd for Blake, convinced he was the only interesting person at the party. When I started Click, I never dreamed of a day like today. We have done so much for these children, but the fight must continue until all underprivileged children have access to documentation. More clapping. This evening, it is my profound honor to unveil the first annual Click Silent Auction, sponsored by Silence, the podcast. Soon, you will have an opportunity to bid on photos taken by actual Click children. Purple drapes were drawn from behind her uh, to reveal a grid of framed photos. The photographs were familiar to me, with their dim living room lighting, the cabinets full of bulk, off-brand junk food, the tables cluttered with colorful bills, the harried mothers on couches clutching their feet, the fathers dunking their heads in their gnarled hands, the dismantled automobiles on cinder blocks in overgrown yards, the carved open sheetrock in half-remodeled bedrooms, empty change jars in kitchens, inflatable mattresses deflated on living room floors. The photos reminded me of the apartments I'd shared with my parents before they split up. I saw in these houses the houses of aunts and uncles who lived in the impoverished wake of shuttered factories in Pennsylvania, aunts and uncles and cousins I hated to visit out of an unspoken fear their misfortune might infect me. Though I knew enough to feel embarrassed of my upbringing, at least compared to the other guests here, I never considered myself poor. My parents were just well enough, to fear, well enough to fear the shame that poverty carried. If they couldn't afford something, they bought it on credit, and every few months they opened new credit cards to pay off the old ones, constructing an elaborate Ouroboros out of their debts. All that effort landed them on the wall, alien enough to be bought, studied, commented on. More than anything, pitied. Farther down the wall were starker depictions of woe, photographs taken by children who lived on the streets, ref refugee children, the children of addicts. Bidding on these started at twice the amount of the photos familiar to me. All proceeds support the continued efforts of Click to ensure our mission will thrive far beyond our lives, Claire Lance said. Flash bulbs erupted, the crowd applauded volcanically. The photographs beamed on me like a spotlight from a guard tower. I split the crowd for the exit and didn't look back, fearing my expression might betray shame rather than pity. Cassandra gripped my wrist. 
It's devastating, she said, hand on her heart. The lives of these children make me want to weep for a week. I told her I didn't feel well. Oh, I get it, she said. How could anyone feel well around photos like this? It's not the photos, I said. I'm lucky I haven't fainted. I want to take every one of these children into my home. Oh, dear, I wish there was some way that I could help them even more. Bidding won't do anything for them. Pessimism is poison, Sasha. I'll loan you some money. Pay me back whenever you... No, I'll give you the money. If she didn't know why the photos unsettled me, after all, I'd called off work to join her here. Then I didn't want to tell her. Instead, I accused Click of fraud, knowing she would be swayed by righteousness. We don't even know where the money is going, I said. Does it all go to the children or back to Claire Lance's hair dyeing fund? I pulled a lot of favors to get you in here, she said. I can't participate in this, I said. She reluctantly agreed to leave on ethical grounds. Outside, she said, word of advice. Open up to tolerance and forgiveness. You're so quick to refuse things, to find reasons not to participate. You hold so many grudges, but you need to accept the world with all of its flaws. Why leave if that's what you think, I asked. If the fundraiser made you uncomfortable, then I want to show my support. She draped her hands over my shoulders, leaned close, clouding me in the scent of mint and lavender. I say this because I love you, Sasha. Your intensity can be very off-putting. People just feel it. Cy Cunningham told me about you. He mentioned my name. You're always wanting something. You're always trying. I don't even think I told him my name. You didn't, she said. He described an antsy woman or a nervous woman, and my heart sunk when it dawned on me that it was you. People don't like people who want something from them. But I do want something from them, I said. I want the same things you want from them. Their attention, their support, their money. I need their money, unlike you. Whoops, rewind, she said, then contorted her mouth. She held up her palm as if carrying something and flicked away that invisible something. My comment. All was forgotten. Only by wanting nothing do we receive anything, she said, posing chin up. A red sedan pulled up beside her. The passenger window buzzed down. Cassandra Hansen, said the driver. She slipped into the back seat. Traffic swallowed her car. I paced in front of the venue entrance, agonizing over her comments about my intensity. The same red car paused at the curb. Cassandra stepped out. Did you forget something, I asked. The rest of my evening, she said. She waved over her shoulder as she entered the building. Can I bum a cigarette, someone behind me asked. Do I look like I smoke, I shouted, before I saw who'd spoken. Blake Days stood at my back, guitar slung on his shoulder. That's a relief, he said. My grandmother, she died of lung cancer. (laughs) Mine too, I lied. I (laughs) I shouldn't have shouted. Smoking is so disrespectful, he said. Everyone gets so mad about man spreading, but smoking is magnitudes worse. It's air spreading, spreading your air into other people's air without their permission. Give me a man spreader over an air spreader any day. Absolutely, I said. Something about him made me want to agree with whatever he said. You know, I saw you from the stage while I was performing. You have such an arresting presence. I could barely concentrate. I apologized. Never apologize. If this is going to work, you have to promise me to never apologize. If what is going to work? Do you promise? I promised. Good. Now let's get off the street. I know a great place nearby. I don't normally drink. You don't drink or you don't drink in public? I smiled. This place is always empty, he said. No one will ever know. Normally, I resisted pickup attempts like Blake's, with their mix of presumption and force, but the click photos and Cassandra's advice had made me pliable. Blake brought me to an underground dive bar full of torn booths that smelled like acetone. Blake Bear, the bartender growled when we enter. Get a beer, Blake told me. Henry's the worst bartender in the city. He can barely scoop ice into a glass. Quit hauling around that stupid guitar, Henry told Blake. To me, he said, I'm guessing he hasn't sung to you yet if you're here. He's no musician. His voice sounds like a car on fire. I heard him perform earlier, I said. It was wonderful. Blake pointed his thumb at me. See? 
That's the problem with Blake, the bartender said. He's lovable. Worst part about him. It concealed all his glaring and dangerous fault flaws. Oh, Henry, how I should have listened to you. Blake flipped him off, then leaned over the bar for a back-slapping hug. The bartender's warning only endeared me to Blake. After a night among grifters at Click, I was happy to observe their intimate derision. Something tells me you're both awful, I said. Right on the money, said Henry, laughing. This one is very perceptive. Over stiff whiskey sodas, parked at the bar's darkest and stiffest booth, Blake unloaded his life on me like dirt into a grave. He told me about his unwed hippie parents and his twin older sisters and the freight train that passed behind his childhood home in rural Wisconsin. He used to sit on his roof watching the train pass, imagining himself riding into larger, exciting worlds where I could be who I wanted to be, he said. It was the cheesiest thing I ever fell for. It was my turn to spill. I told him about feeling mortified by the photos at Click. I'm never working for Click again, he said, in solidarity with you. You barely know me, I said. It occurred to me he hadn't even asked for my name yet. That's because names are chains to the people we aren't, he said. (laughs) I wish I could throw Blake days in the river. Every time I say Blake, you think of every Blake you've known before me. And I'm not those Blakes, but those Blakes shoulder in alongside me. I say we abolish permanent names. Everyone we meet should assign us a name of their choosing. I was charmed by his enthusiasm. With a laugh, I asked, what would you call me? He leaned over the table and took my hands in his, circled his thumbs in my palms. This is tough because, as you said, I hardly know you. I don't even know where you're from. But based on our evening so far, and what an amazing evening, I think I'd call you Sasha. Shut up. I yanked my hands free. You had to have known. He swore he didn't, and he maintained this through the end of the relationship, committed to fabricating a profound sense of insight and mystery. In time, I would find his stubbornness obstructive, like a skyscraper blocking the sun. But that evening, I felt the first splash of attraction. I wanted him. I wanted him to want me back. Later that night, on the steps of my building, he gave me a syrupy kiss at once passionate and reserved. He seemed above the kiss, as if it weren't worth a fully committed makeout. I invited him inside, planning to sleep with him and move on. Not yet, he said. You're assuming a lot, I said, feeling stung. I hadn't been refused like this in years. It's not an assumption. He spun on his heels and skipped into the lamp-lit night. The next morning, he sent me a link to his first album, Days and Days, a plaintive four-track EP about former lovers and sunsets. My fascination with Blake lunged towards love with every repeated listen. Love came easily to me. Normally, I tried lovers on like dresses, but Blake was different. Something about him clawed into me. He didn't want me, and I found myself frustrated by every text that wasn't from him, angry at every hour apart. He became my boyfriend, I, his girlfriend. And as his girlfriend, I discovered that even more than a girlfriend, he wanted an audience. He not only absorbed me into that role, he made me feel special for filling it. He praised himself constantly, quoted his lyrics in conversation, often in support of something I had said. And after meals, we would amble through the streets as he tested out lyrics, singing softly enough so only I heard. These walks gave me the feeling of slipping inside the world's most fragile glass box. A box, I believed, he had created solely for me. Around him, I tended to blend. It is like this with men who imagine futures for themselves. They arrive driving a car. Get in, they say. I wanted to see where it took me. Not because I wasn't ambitious. Abandon thrived over the course of our relationship, becoming more popular than I had ever predicted, and I wanted it to grow even bigger. Yet the future we envisioned was his. It left little room for what I wanted, and I loved him enough to pretend this wasn't a problem. At his shows, I stood near the bar, as if I were Dyson in an ad for Blake's life, excited that the men at the center of everyone's attention would come home with me. I let this dynamic continue because I believed I knew the person no one else knew, the vulnerable person hidden inside the musician perched on tipping stools. 
What I loved about loving a performer was believing they never truly performed in front of me. I believed in two intertwined but separate Blakes. Blake Days, the musician, conflicted with the authentic Blake I loved. The Blake I loved offstage was goofy and weepy, prone to puns, sensitive to fluorescent lighting, a fan of obstacle-based game shows, an eager and talentless cook, an unglum lover. A human. Around him, I freed my true self, giggly and gullible, a lounger, insecure, a late sleeper who woke to bed sheets wetted by sweat, ticklish, cold toed, an unintentional killer of plants, pessimistic, exhausted, alone. What a pleasure to know someone so secretly. I assumed he felt the same way about me. In the final month of our relationship, though I didn't know it was that final month then, Blake surprised me by booking us a posh cabin on the outskirts of my hometown. I want to see where you're from, he told me. I assured him there was nothing to see. Then show me nothing. He wanted to spend the weekend with me alone, not with my fans, so we left our phones in the city. Ditching my phone and the people inside it meant confronting the feelings I normally buried through work. Driving along the winding country roads to my hometown felt like riding a tongue into a mouth. This trip would end with both of us swallowed, dissolved in the belly of my childhood. Blake crooned cartoonishly to mock the top 40 hits on the radio. He considered these musicians beneath him, sellouts, but his envy was so obvious to me, and I felt closer to him and distracted from my dread by seeing into the feelings he'd never admit to. By the time we made it to town, my eyes were dewy and red. I had no family around, no lovers to fear running into. My mother had moved to Virginia to live with an ex. She had promptly dumped him, but remained in the South. But the last time I'd returned home, during my first year of college, Dyson was at his sickest. I feared I might dissolve into guilt on our trip. There was still time to go back, I said, as we rolled into a gas station. I've come all this way to see the famous nothing, Blake said, playing the part of a tourist. He kissed my ear, playing the part of my boyfriend. I'm here to see what made you. I made me, I said. Then you're the first landmark. He pulled out a disposable camera from his coat pocket and snapped a photo of me in profile. My mouth curled in amusement. It was late autumn, cold enough for a parka and hats. The leaves had already fallen, and what remained of the trees were the broken fingers of branches. The air smelled of hot tires and pennies. We went for a walk down Main Street, once the center of town, home to a hair salon and a toy shop and a used army surplus store, now home to a former hair salon and a former toy shop and a former used army surplus and store and piles of wet wood scraps on the sidewalk. The front window of the salon had been shattered. No one cared enough to cardboard over the hole. This isn't a place to return to, I said. It's a place to escape. Deep, he said with a smile. He loved to tease my self-importance. A dollar store had replaced the old firehouse. The library had burned down. Bees had taken over the Dairy Queen. The post office had packed its suitcase and left in the night. All the pizza places remained pizza places but were empty, their open signs impatiently flickering. The cemetery had doubled in size. Lesterton prided itself on having the cheapest plots in the state. My mother's day spa was now a kennel for exotic pets. The supermarket where Dyson stocked up for purges had become a retirement home. The elderly roamed the lot, clicking their canes. I brought Blake to the only remaining landmark in town, the river behind the high school where everyone hooked up after class. We used to spread out behind the trees on the banks of the river, becoming adults, the sounds of the rushing water muffling the awkward silence of teenagers fucking. Sometimes Dyson slipped out here to throw up after lunch but runoff from a nearby M&M plant had been tainting the water for decades, the town had recently learned, and the river had been diverted away from the school. Makeout Creek was reduced to a flaky, mudded riverbed. This town is so embarrassing, I said. My fear of returning home had flattened into shame. Everything here used to be something else. And then Blake unleashed the wisest and kindest thing anyone had ever said to me. The wisest and kindest thing that anyone had ever said to anyone, ever. Everything in this town used to hurt you, you mean. 
My love for him leaped through the ceiling. That's exactly what I mean, I said, and stretched up for a kiss. We drove straight to the cabin, a luxurious cherry wood A-frame outfooted with flat screen TVs and bay windows and a fireplace and jacuzzi and a pair of espresso machines in the kitchen and fucked without shutting the door. Over the weekend, Blake drafted new songs while I biked, while I hiked, or scripted future live streams for my followers. I spent entire mornings in a recliner at the window, sipping coffee as Blake strummed his guitar. We shared sprawling dinners and laughed and fucked until the morning sun was glossing the windows. For the first time in years, I drank and smoked and relaxed in complete disregard of abandon. That was the public Sasha's responsibility. The authentic Sasha, the Sasha having a romantic weekend with her lover, the authentic Blake, deserved to enjoy herself, and that meant living as decadently as she pleased. Sunday afternoon, before leaving, I lounged on a moose skin rug in front of the fireplace as Blake performed the song he'd been writing all weekend. The true you was about our weekend together, from Main Street to our talk at the riverbed, to smoking and fucking and drinking and eating. Blake had never written a song about me before, and though I loved the attention he paid me and the care that had gone into the song, I made him promise to never release it. I worried my followers would ditch me if they knew I'd been cheating on abandon. I love that you want me to keep this for us, Blake said. The fire crackled behind him. He kissed my forehead, my eyebrows, the bridge of my nose, my chin, my neck, each cheek, each ear, and finally, my mouth. This will be ours for as long as I love you, he said. A contract masquerading as devotion. This wasn't the last time we kissed, but it's the kiss I return to and I want to think fondly of our relationship. A month after the trip, Lucas DeVry took his life and Blake dumped me. He accused me of sabotaging his career. I was a fraud, he insisted, a star fucker who had never deserved him. Our ending was not a breakup, but a heave. He considered himself a plane taking flight. I was the weight he needed to cut in order to lift off. Two weeks into my exile, Blake released The You I Knew, a vindictive rewrite of the true you about a woman who hides her authentic self from her sensitive boyfriend. <laughs> In describing our weekend together, he exposed the Sasha I showed only to him, who didn't adhere to the demands she made on her clients. My few remaining followers bailed. The You I Knew, he sang, was never the true you. A song for idiots. A song for anyone who'd ever been hurt. A song I played on repeat to torture myself. I never lied to Blake once throughout our relationship. And I normally lied to my boyfriends, often out of boredom. But Blake never bored me. He may have been the first boyfriend I actually loved. I showed him parts of myself I never showed anyone. But he was too conceited to notice. Thank you so much.